There's another really interesting person who fits in that mold, who's been part of the committee's work. He has remained mostly behind the scenes until now. You may have seen some news about him this weekend. His name is Denver Riggleman. He's now very much in the public eye because he's written a book, which is coming out tomorrow, about his work as a staffer for the January 6th committee. Riggleman had an interesting path to the committee. He spent more than a decade in the Air Force, where he worked as an intelligence officer. In 2003, he was posted to the National Security Agency, and a few years later, he co-founded a military contracting company. After selling that business, Riggleman and his wife began a new venture, opening a distillery in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. It was their frustration with Virginia's liquor taxes and strict regulations, which, by the way, are quite strict, that inspired Denver Riggleman to get into politics. In 2016, he launched a somewhat quixotic campaign for governor, calling it a, quote, whiskey rebellion, gained a following but struggled to raise money, dropped out three months later before the Republican primary. Soon, another opportunity arose when a congressional seat opened up in Virginia's 5th District. The incumbent there, Republican Tom Garrett, you may remember this story, was facing accusations he used his staff as, quote, personal servants and decided not to run for re-election. And so in 2018, with the endorsement of then-President Donald Trump, Denver Riggleman was elected to the United States Congress. He immediately joined the far-right Freedom Caucus, voted with President Trump 92% of the time. But Riggleman also began to develop a reputation for some heterodoxy, for reaching across the aisle, sometimes riling up his own party. When he officiated the same-sex wedding of two of his campaign staffers, the far-right turned on Riggleman. It was the beginning of the end of his quite short congressional career, finished off by a primary challenge from a more conservative candidate. Dan Riggleman also started speaking out about the influence of the far right, the dangers of disinformation and conspiracy theories that have fully infiltrated the Republican Party. In his farewell speech on the House floor, he admonished the bad actors in his party who were spreading lies about the 2020 election. A well-instructed people and a knowledgeable people. Pillars of a working republic. Those pillars are now being assaulted by disinformation and outlandish theories surrounding this presidential election. As we transition to a new administration, I implore all to consider the sources of information you receive, to fact check diligently and to recognize that many bad actors who spread spurious and fantastical conspiracy theories under banners like QAnon, Kraken, Stop the Seal, Steal, Scamdemic, and many other emotive terms and coded language are not disseminating information rooted in the knowledge, but with questionable motives and greed. So Denver Riggleman, with that speech, essentially moved into the same categories as former colleagues, Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, Liz Cheney of Wyoming, who are on the committee, conservative Republicans who recognize the acute danger of the MAGA movement, the one that is taking over the party. And when the House launched its investigation in January 6th, it was committee vice chair Liz Cheney who recommended Denver, Riggle, Denver Riggleman to join the staff. He drew in his intelligence experience working to analyze data, including online activity and call records. In the book, Riggleman wrote about his experience. He left the committee in April. He presents some new information, in particular about one of the phone calls that he analyzed. You get a real aha moment when you see that the White House switchboard had connected to a rioter's phone while it's happening. That's a big, pretty big aha moment. You get an aha. Wait a minute. Someone in the White House was calling one of the rioters while the riot was going on? On January 6th, absolutely. And you know who both ends of that call? I only know one end of that call. I don't know the White House end, which I believe is more important. But the thing is, the American people need to know that there are link connections that need to be explored more. Now, let me be clear. Members of the committee are clearly not happy about what Denver Riggleman is saying. Congressman Adam Schiff of California, Jimmy Raskin of Maryland, both took the opportunity to shoot down Riggleman's book's claimed revelations this weekend. You know, I, I can't say anything specific about that particular call, but we are aware of it, uh, and we're aware of lots of contacts between uh, people in the White House and different people that were involved, obviously, in the, the coup attempt. and. Mm -hmm the insurrection. I can't comment on the particulars. I can say that, you know, each of the issues that Mr. Riggleman raised uh, during the period he was with the committee, which ended, uh, you know, quite some time ago, uh, we looked into. And one of the things I think that has given our committee credibility is we've been very careful about what we say, not to overstate matters, not to understate matters. Uh, and, uh, and without the advantage of the additional information we've gathered since he left the committee, you know, it, it uh, I think, poses real risk to be suggesting things. 
In a statement, the committee said in part, quote, Mr. Riggleman had limited knowledge of the committee's investigation. He departed from the staff in April prior to our hearings and much of our most important investigative work. Since his departure, the committee has run down all the leads, digested and analyzed all the information that arose from his work. And joining me now is the man in question, former Congressman Demer Riggleman. His new book out tomorrow is The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th. Good to have you here. Hey, thanks, Chris. So let's start on this. First, first of all, the, the sort of broader context. The committee is clearly not happy. Um, here's how I understand they see it. You can sort of tell between the lines, right? You essentially betrayed a trust, right? You go to work on staff there. Now you're out selling a book. They asked you if you're going to sell a book. You said no. Now you are telling things that they haven't fully vetted or things that they feel they want to control the information on, and ergo that you're a, you're a somewhat untrustworthy character. Yeah, I didn't betray their trust. They knew I was going to write a book beforehand. New York Times back in April 2021, I said that. But, you know, the thing is, I don't want to make this about, you know, some kind of a beef about the committee because it's obvious they didn't read the book yet. So that's really what it comes down to. And it's uh, it was a little bit surprising, but uh, the thing is, some of those individuals saying that, I really think have done a fantastic job. And it was... Uh, it was a little bit interesting to see them say some of those things. Well, I guess the question here is, do you, are you hoping the committee is successful in its undertaking? Oh, my goodness, yes. And that's why, you know, when I wrote the book, I'm like, how do we prove, how do we show that the minutest form of data, the smallest bite, uh, proves that the committee is in the right direction? So a lot of this book, sadly, I think people are going to be angry. This is not a, even an indictment against the committee. It's actually a positive book about the committee. Uh, but it does show that there, we can be more aggressive in the information warfare space. And uh, just, you know, for instance, today, I, I just find it funny, uh, you know, following up every lead, that's great, but you got to know where to look. So today, you know, in the book, you know, I talked about Kelly Sorrell, that we saw the littlest tiny bit of data was that she tried to text the White House on December 20th. So that obviously wasn't followed up because today we had an NBC reporter call about that tiny tidbit. And we find out that Kelly Sorrell was texting Andrew Giuliani. So the issue is, is that you got to look at the data. They might look at thousands of leads. But these are not counterterrorism analysts. And what I'm saying, though, is that the investigation is going great. The committee has done well. But we're in a new war. Uh, we're in a forever war and an information war. And you have to look at these tiny pieces of data to really put together the command and control architecture that these individuals use. And the fact is, I think some of this dialogue that they're having, which some of it's, you know, a little bit sad. You know, I'm not a, not a sociopath. You know, sometimes I get my feelings hurt. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're still using our same data teams, the ones I built, the contracts, the millions of lines of data, the call detail records, the text messages. That's all of our team. That's me. So, I, you know, I find it interesting that what they, they would say that. Well, here, here's the other thing that I, I got from, from Schiff's statement there, right, is that they understand they have a target painted on their back, right? And anything... Any slip up, any error is going to be the source of massive blowback and discrediting. And you can see that they have been rem extremely careful, and I would say small c conservative, in what they prevented, presented. They made deliberations. This is a, your book is a channel outside of those deliber deb deliberations about what gets made public. Well, that's because the data is owned by the Americans. So it's owned by Americans. It's not owned by me. It's not owned by the committee. This is public trust. I was a former congressman. I was a former CEO. I've done this for 20 years. I probably forgot more about data analytics than everybody on the committee, right? But that's why they picked me. It, you know, you talk about, you know, limited knowledge. Well, if limited knowledge is 20 years in the counterterrorism field, that's uh, that's sort of sort of something. Let, let's talk about this one phone call, right? So, sure. So we know. I mean, I don't think this has been disputed. I think this is established. It's right? Fact. There, it's a fact, right? There was a phone call. It's uh, a fact from the White House switchboard. It's a, yeah, that's a landline that landline. actually wraps to the switchboard. It's a default number that you can actually set through your call manager. So just like desk phones here, right. you call off your desk phone, it goes to a default number, and it goes to an individual. And that individual was uh, a rider at the Capitol, I Correct. think. Correct. Uh, and it happens around 4.30, I think, is that right? Like 16.34 sort of, local. Yeah. Um, I guess the, what do you make of that, right? So, yes, it is an aha moment when you hear it, right? The question is like, well, what does it add up to? Right, what it adds up to is how in the world... In any way, would you have somebody on a White House desk calling a rioter on January 6th? Let's go through it. Were they wearing pizza? Dialed the wrong number? Probably not. Right? Or um, how about was it a girlfriend? Right. You know, or who an associate or someone was they knew that was in town from a low-level staff. Right? Yeah. I mean, so we have an associate, whoever on that desk phone, is calling a rioter who's, a, who's been convicted, who's a DOJ, DOJ charged defendant. Here's the only thing. By the way, the committee is pursuing this. They wanted to see the White House numbers. They couldn't get them. There's hundreds of them. 
So there's so much more here. So to say that, well, um, but what's the so much more, right? To that, that here's my understanding of what I've seen following this very closely, right? Right. You've got the White House is whipping this up, right? Donald right. Trump is whipping this up. Right. He's got this sort of people that are his kind of off books team, right? The, right. the Bannon and the Roger Stone, and right. and then he's got people floating around. Meadows sort of the center, of it, and then this, this sort of wide array of characters, right, who are showing up. The question always is, what's the level of coordination? And then more deeply, how much coordination do you need when the guy with the biggest megaphone in the world is telling people, like, go down to the Capitol? Well, you need a little bit of coordination if you're talking about multiple groups that have multiple objectives. And, you know, in the military, you know, it's really commander's intent. And the commander's intent was we want to keep President Trump in power. That's what he told us to do. Um, all of these groups, though, they had sort of different organizations and they had to talk to each other. And if you look at, you know, if you look at Kelly Sorrell, uh, if you look at Rhodes and Tario and those individuals that were, you know, in the basement. Stuart Rhodes of the Oath Stuart Keepers, Rose, Enrique Tario, who's, should probably, yeah, who's of the so Proud Boys. It's all right. Sorry about that, Chris. Yeah. You know, I, I know this pretty well. When you see that all three of those have been charged with conspiracy or seditious conspiracy, and you see that there's actually phone links between these individuals, and then you have links to Roger Stone that are specific, you know, that will come out eventually, right? That there's actually phone calls happening between these individuals. So that's the kind of thing. It's like, okay, we know that Roger Stone, we saw a signal chat, you know, for, on the newspaper, the Washington Post, they reported great reporting on that. We see all these different things, but oh, by the way, we have digital confirmation that these individuals were in contact, and that is, that is massive. Yeah, let me, let me talk about Stone. Sure. This is a book after I mean, it always seemed to me, again, without any access to any data, that Stone was sort of in the middle of a Venn diagram, right? I mean, we've got him. We know that he's in the Willard ho uh, in the in the hotel, right? The day right. of in the sort of war room. We know he's around Eastman. We know he has uh, Proud Boys or Oath Keeper bodyguards, right? So all this stuff is we, we've seen. Right. Um, you write in the book that along with the top members of the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, his number was connected to higher level Trump associates, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, Bernie Carrick, former NYPD commissioner, close ally Rudy Giuliani, Arthur Schwartz, who's a Manhattan political consultant, worked closely with Donald Trump Jr. How central do you think Stone's role is? I think since 2016. I mean, he's the stop the steal sort of founder there. So when you think about somebody and you see what he's said, who he's been with, who he's hired, who he's called, who he's contacted, Roger Stone is one of the most important factors of what happened on January 6th. It's just, it's not just in what he has said himself, but it's really in the link connections, in the data, and in the people that work for him. So if you look at Kristen Davis, right? Kristen Davis maybe didn't practice as good operational security as Roger Stone. Maybe Kristen Davis is She's also a long-time associate of Roger long Stone. Long-time association, Florida. right, yeah. uh, with Roger Stone. And, and maybe she also liked to hang around with Mike Flynn. And, you know, maybe she was looser with her phones or her text messages. So, you know, that's why the... And that's why I keep going back. The committee's on the right track here. Uh, they've done a fantastic job. But the American public needs to know why they're doing such a great job is because the data is backing up their play here. How would you, in the year 2022, as we sit here, um, describe yourself politically, ideologically? I'm unaffiliated. I, I, there's no, I mean, even looking at, you know, even what happened in the last couple of days, you know, it's funny is that it, it, I would do the same, you know, if you're in a political tribe, you have to sort of rally the troops around you, right? Or if you feel like you don't know what's coming or you're uncertain of what's happening. So I have a feeling when the book releases tomorrow as an unaffiliated individual, I think people are going to calm down a little bit. Because when you look at it, the committee has talked about a lot of this stuff. But I wanted to explain to individuals, people that weren't in the D.C. Beltway, people who maybe come through my distillery, they can read a 280-page book that can break it down like this is why it happened and this is why it's true well, and the committee's well, correct. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about. I mean, I, you know, you were a Republican and you, I think, consider yourself a conservative. I, I do. I do. Um, oh, yeah. How do you understand what's ha what's happened? I mean, you are someone who I think along the lines of Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, you know, you have a specific set of yes. beliefs, worldview. You've watched this utterly sort of toxic and insidious form of disinformation, lies, uh, alternate reality kind of come to sort of exercise domain over people that I imagine you call friends and... I've lost family and friends. Pe family, people that you know very well who, who believe things that you know not to be true. How do you understand what's happened? I, you know, you understand it from really, and you know, there's things that I'm going to say that's really backed up by what people say, you know, self-identify. But I think it comes from a belief system of good against evil where they're just easily radicalized. And this is intensely personal to me. You know, after the wedding, Chris, you know, uh, when somebody comes up to your face, 
from me to you. This is after the staffer's wedding, which is a after same sex after marriage, after marriage that you officiated. Wedding. That's yeah. right. So the, I might be a little bit angrier than other people. This guy, I, this is very personal to me. I mean, not just the death threats or people messing with my vehicle while my daughter is driving it, which was actually an attempt on, on my life. That stuff happened. Right. And I had somebody come to my face after with my two staffers, after marrying them and, and scream. And you're the general of the sodomite armies. Right. I was called the tool of the Antichrist. My wife was called the spawn of Satan. By the way, that would make us the biggest power couple in the United States. But, you know, um, good line. right. And all, <laughs> and also, if you think about it, too, with the distillery, we were we were accused of funneling money for George Soros through our distillery. Um, it was but how did you what, do you know that backlash was coming and when you were face to face with it? Because I know I've talked to a lot of people who have been in your in some version of your shoes. I mean, if you saw Rusty Bowers, right? Jim? Right. I mean, people who I mean, I've, I've talked to random public health people in, you know, Tennessee, who one day they're out there saying, oh, you should wear masks. The next I got people out at their door. Like, how did you understand what is happening in America that that happened to you and keeps happening to people? Radicalization. Social media has changed the landscape. Um, and the ability to put money behind radicalization is maybe the biggest thing we've ever mm -hmm. seen. You, I mean, Chris, we can, we can pick anywhere we want to go on the Internet, right? Deep web, dark web, open web. I can go to any forum. Right. I'm not even going to. I was about to tell a yeah, joke. Yeah, I won't. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but I think we can go anywhere that we want. <laughs> <laughs> we could, you know, we can self select whatever we want. We've gone to a unicast world. It's not multicast anymore. We can self select yeah. that crazy place you're going to. And by the way, it's good against evil. We're I'm a globalist. A lot. Yeah. You know, so there you go. Devin Riggleman, uh, author of The Breach, which is out tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. That was a really uh, illuminating. Thank you.